Thank you everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining today's session and welcome to the University of Manchester's second virtual open week. Um, so today I'm joined by course director of our MA in Educational Leadership in Practice, Dr Alex gardner Mattaget, and I'm really lucky to also be joined by one of our current students, Martin Lipton. You may have seen him before on um, a little podcast me and him did a couple of months ago, uh, but Martin joined this course in February this year, so it's great we've got him on today's call because both Alex and Martin are going to walk you through and provide you with an insight into this MA in Educational Leadership in Practice course, but also tell you a little bit about what it's been like to study on the course and how it can really, really help you in your career, uh, whatever you are up to at the moment. So we would like to make this session quite interactive. And in order for that to happen, we really kind of need your input. So please do kind of submit your questions, comments and thoughts, but most of all, really engage with us so we can get to know you as prospective students and really help you um, and aid you making that kind of informed decision about next steps. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to introduce who, who I am now. Um, some of you, if not all of you, will have heard from me already. Um, but my name's Daisy. I'm one of the course advisors based here in Manchester. Um, the MA in Educational Leadership in Practice course sits within my portfolio. So what that means is I look after it in terms of student recruitment and student support. So my main role is to really offer support and guidance at every stage of your decision making journey. Um, I've got over four years of experience within student recruitment and higher education. Um, I moved to Manchester in February this year after working for a number of years down in London. Um, not only do I look after this course, but I also look after another um, number of online and blended learning courses at the University of Manchester. I'm responsible for delivering webinars such as this one and kind of other um, interactive sessions as well. But most importantly, and probably one of the most enjoyable aspects of my role is conducting Zoom consultations with prospective students such as yourselves. So really getting to know you on a personal level and kind of helping you make that decision about next steps um, in choosing the right course um, for you. So I, um, that's me. I'm going to hand you over to Alex. He's going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit, little bit about um, his role at the university. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much, Daisy. Um, so my name is Alex and I am the uh, course director here on this program of educational leadership in practice. Uh, yeah, I've worked in international education practically all of my life. I graduated from London University in 1995, a long time ago, and basically went abroad from there and have been working abroad ever since that time, um, uh, except for the last five years or so, uh, where previously I was at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, which some of you might know, um, as a senior lecturer in leadership in the uh, Department of Communication and Applied Behavioral Sciences, uh, training nationally and internationally. And, uh, but I've also been um, a middle manager in international school, as well as a lecturer and tutor um, all over the world in colleges and universities. Um, so, and, and on this course here, you'll obviously be connected with some of the leading scholars and researchers in the world, in the field of educational leadership, management and administration. Um, those people who have played significant parts in defining the field and making it what it is today. Uh, notable luminar luminaries include Professor Helen Gunter, um, Professor Mel Ainsgro, uh, Dr. Stephen Courtney, um, and then other colleagues who are now forming the field, such as uh, uh, Dr. Paul Armstrong, Dr. Stephen Rayner, uh, Dr. B. Hughes um, and others. Uh, so there you go. Quick introduction from me. Thanks, Alex. And Martin, it'd be great for you to say hello and just tell us um, who you are. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Daisy. Uh, my name is Martin Lipton. I am a Scottish trained teacher um, living in Germany. I'm currently the deputy head teacher of a bilingual school in Germany. Um, after joining the course back in February, um, I'm here to discuss my experience so far of the course and also to yeah, answer any questions if you have any. Brilliant. Thanks, Martin. Alex, over to you. Right. OK, so 
I must stress, we've, we're really pleased to have Martin on today. Uh, Martin's been with us now for half a year. So I'm really, actually, I'm really interested to hear what Martin will say about the course as well. Um, so why would you choose a course like this? What does it do for you? Uh, what's, what's your outlook uh, before and after taking this course? Well, uh, there's some text here, which I can read out to you. It's suitable for educators and educational practitioners. We're looking to enhance skills and leadership within schools or further your career within this area. This course offers a balance between a strategic focus, theoretical foundations and practical applications to apply directly into the workplace. And it is a two year blended learning course, including online interactive study and face to face workshops taught by the world leading academics in education policy and educational leadership. Now I'll just unpick those a little bit. So um, typically we'll see people joining this course who are anywhere from teachers all the way up to already being directors or senior principals of schools. Uh, as you know, some people, uh, especially in the international context, they manage to get quite high up the food chain uh, and, and always know I should have done that master's 10 years ago, but I never got around to it. Uh, and this is an ideal place for them. Um, and that's where we see some of uh, some of our students coming from. Alternatively, you may be uh, an ambitious teacher or educator or head of department or coordinator. And you may be aware that you have skills uh, that are strategic, uh, that are about bigger picture thinking. So, and you are keen to develop and become a leader and move up the food chain and go to that next job interview and have your CV at the top of the pile rather than at the bottom of the pile. So that is ideal for you, this kind of course. Um, what this course does that other courses don't really do so much is it, it delivers that very strong academic profile that Manchester is specialized in that makes it, you know, ranked 27th in the world, number six in Britain, I believe. It's, it's got that very strong academic uh, focus behind it, a uh, large amount of intellectualism, a lot of it which is produced in-house in Manchester, but it combines it with a practical approach, meaning that you're continually asked and challenged throughout the course to reflect upon your practice. And this is actually a mentoring relationship, if you think about it, which develops over the two years. So it's not just an MA that's academic, it's also an MA that develops you and grows your thinking capacities over time. And because it's two years and blended, it means that you can work full time in your job, doing what you need to, to be doing, and then do this on the side. That's why we crafted it like that. For those of you who are abroad and are worried about terms such as online, because as we know abroad, many countries, uh, um, especially developing countries, shouldn't say that term, let's say less fortunate countries um, have things in place that mean that an online degree is, is not recognized. Well, we know that, which is why this degree is treated exactly the same as any of our face-to-face -face degrees that we um, give at Manchester and the certificate that you receive at the end of the degree is on a par and worded exactly the same way as any degree that you would get if you came and studied face-to-face -face in Manchester. There you go. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Martin, just a quick one from me. Um, so just kind of thinking about prospective students who might be on today's call. Um, what kind of initially attracted you to this course? Now, obviously, you probably asked this question, is this course the right fit for you? So could you kind of answer this thinking back to before February when you when you joined us? Yeah, um, one of the reasons why this course stood out to me was more for the blended aspect um, of learning in terms of it wasn't just a full online course where everything was generated online and you had to work independently by yourself. I really liked the idea of coming together at meetings throughout the um, academic years um, of practice and having the opportunity to speak to other professionals across every aspect of the educational spectrum from um, professionals who work in nurseries, professionals who work in primary schools, professionals who work in um, the high school area that I work in, professionals who work in tertiary education as well. So it was really important that it allowed that discussion process to take. And I really thought that was a major strength in comparison to other universities. 
Um, following that as well, yeah, the close contact that this course seemed to adopt with the lecturers or the course tutors, um, because throughout the courses, I'll probably really again later, is that the contact that you have with the tutor, as Alex said, is very much more on a personal level rather than an electronic email every now and again to see how you're getting on. Um, so they're the two main points that really contributed to my application going into Manchester. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Martin. That's that's super insightful. Um, so I guess, um, Alex, it'd be great if you could walk through the, the academic team um, of Martin, you probably recognise a few of these anyway, but yeah, for the benefit of people on today's call, it'd be great for a bit of a run through of this. Yeah, right. So from top left, we have Dr. Stephen Rayner, um, who was a um, much like um, much like you, Martin, was an assistant or deputy principal for a long time, uh, did his BA in uh, French and German, interestingly, at University of Cambridge long time ago, um, and is now our Director of Teaching and Learning in MIE. Um, he last year won um, uh, best paper and best research projects with the uh, British Education Leadership and Management Association. Uh, so uh, quite a notable scholar. He's a core member of our team. Uh, Dr. Paul Armstrong is my deputy. He is a senior lecturer, um, also a programme director of, of another uh, program at Manchester, uh, also a central member on the team, um, a very, very prolific researcher and writer, um, uh, who is now leading the unit that, that you're on now, Martin. Uh, Dr. Stephen Courtney is, uh, I would say, um, a highly intellectual uh, rising star within Manchester Institute of Education. Um, he's very, very prolific, has written a great deal. His work is very interesting. I recommend a piece of his which is about uh, the Foucaultian Panopticum. If you Google it, you'll find it's a great read. Um, lots of good stuff of his out there. Uh, then uh, Dr. B. Hughes, who did her PhD at Manchester and is now a senior tutor with us, uh, who also assists on the program, also a great writer um, and researcher. Dr. Drew Whitworth has been with us from the very beginning. He's not so much an educational leadership specialist as uh, digital technologies, uh, one of uh, the, the more notable ones, very well known for that. Uh, and he's part of the, um, the delivery team and the production team, very interesting uh, academic. And then of course, uh, Professor Helen Gunter, who is, um, if you know the field at all, is one of those handful of people who is synonymous with the field, has defined the field, has mapped the field and has been doing so for 30 years an incredibly prolific writer. Most of you will know the book, Leaders and Leadership in Education by Helen Gunter, 2001, which uh, is, I think, one of the first books that most people pick up. It certainly was the first one that I picked up on leadership. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically our team. Oh, and I'm missing one there, because, sorry, the Zoom's in the way. Oh yes, and um, Dr. Loretta Anthony Okeke, uh, who also supports us uh, on the course as well, who looks a, a lot into issues of post-colonialism um, and uh, for, for very interesting and helpful research for us too on educational leadership, administration and management. There we go. That's us. Thanks, Alex. Um, and before I kind of let you walk through this slide, Martin, just um, another question really. How, obviously you've You've mentioned that you're a deputy head at um, kind of a school in Berlin at the moment. Now, how how is this course so far? And I appreciate you're kind of still in your first year, but how is it kind of supported and helped your career to date? And do you see it kind of what's your kind of five year plan almost like what do you want to do kind of going forward? And how do you think this will this will help? I mean, clearly to say to lead education is a bit like uh, <laughs> but essentially I want to be a leader within an educational establishment, essentially, if not five years, then definitely 10 years. Um, but following on from that, this course, I mean, the as much as that's me pretty much finished year one because I've just finished my assignment and I am looking, um, I've now done three, three of the main units. Yet yeah, some of the main aspects that I've learned from this course, even in the position that I'm in at this moment in time is the ability to really take a critical um, outlook on aspects relating to educational leadership and what that means in practice. 
Um, so obviously as a teacher, you're able to reflect and you're able to take a critical stance, but this really allows you to look at academic research and then apply the academics into your own personal context. And that's been very interesting in terms of yeah, the surroundings that I'm in. And I'm pretty certain for the other um, people who are on the course with me in my cohort, I know that it's had that effect on them too. Um, the ability to reflect on, on educational matters from a leadership perspective is very different from a classroom perspective because you're not just looking at one part of a picture, you're looking at the full picture. And that is an important um, skill and ability that this course is helping to allow me to develop. Yeah, great. And um, you mentioned about you've just finished writing an assignment, which is which is great, your final assignment for year one. How have you kind of found managing your time as a teacher, which is obviously very full on and things have changed due, due to kind of COVID and things with kind of writing assignments? And obviously, ultimately, you want to do the best you can. So putting you all into assignments, but also keeping and putting your all into teaching. How have you managed that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose... It would be an underestimation for me to turn around and say it's been very easy because it hasn't. Um, you, if you're signing up to do a master's, then you would want, you need to want and be motivated to go and do it. Um, one of the easier, or one of the things that makes it easier in this course is the fact that uh, for every unit you do have a timeline. And Daisy, you and I spoke about this on the web the webinar. Um, but the timeline really helps focus. Um, your attention on how long things have got or how long you've got to get through units because this course is blended and because you do do most of it online um, it's very easy to like stay in line with that timeline and manage the content appropriately even just trying to balance like your full-time job all the responsibilities that come with that having a life and then doing your work for uni as well it's very for me i find it very very easy because that timeline keeps me to a target and essentially the target is finishing off the coursework so that i'm ready to take on the assignment whenever it comes brilliant that's great thanks martin um, and i guess alex it'd be great to walk through the the different semesters and the units now martin you can you can definitely add because you've done some of these um so alex do you want to just walk through what our students can expect in semester one Oh, Alex, you might be muted. I am. The researcher in me is now uh, looking at this from a researcher's perspective and thinking my view of this and Martin's view of this are likely to be two alternate, but <laughs> equally ex coexistent truths, which would be nice to pick apart some other time. Well, the first unit is called Models of Educational Leadership. So if you've, if you've ever looked into ed leadership before, you'll know that a typical way of theorizing about models, about leadership, is to talk about models. Um, this is because many scholars and, and many researchers like to neatly uh, put sets of competencies and ideas in, group them together and to say this is one way of leading, right? So that's a model of leadership. So we look at that in depth in that um, unit and we try and move your thinking in, in that unit beyond looking at models of leadership and thinking about your leadership and, and how you can grow into a, a leadership um, personality and, and grow your own leadership abilities. Um, in the second unit, it's that's actually a research-based unit. It's called Engaging with Educational, Lead Educational Leadership Research. And that one um, looks, that's quite theoretical. So that really gets to grips with a lot of the intellectual issues that surround uh, what is it to know things. So it's very epistemological, if you like. It looks, it bores down into how do you know what you know? And if you know stuff about leadership, how do you know that that's right? And who's told you that it's right? And how did they find out that it was right? What research practices did they apply to get to that truth? And is that truth applicable? And so by, by opening up that little Pandora's box, um, there are all sorts of philosophical and sociological things that go along with that. And so that's actually my favorite unit. I love that one. That's, uh, that's one where you can spend hours and hours and hours uh, thinking and, and ruminating 
in a, in a, in a dusty little corner in the library. Um, it's wonderful. Okay, so that's those first two units. That's the first semester. Um, and then in the second semester, we have uh, leading educational change and development. So that's the one that Martin's on right now. So that's uh, led by Dr. Paul Armstrong. Um, that's, I mean, they're all very interesting units, but that one there is, is particularly relevant in, in leadership in schools because um, many, many scholars argue that leadership is about change. That's what it is about. Uh, some say it isn't at all. It's about, uh, you know, maintaining. Uh, so there's a, an interesting dialectic that occurs in that unit. And that dialectic is very important, meaning that's the space between, uh, you know, entertaining two often different ideas about what something is and then improving through that process and becoming something greater and bigger and better. Um, Martin will be able to tell you a lot more about that than I am because he's actually doing it at the moment. He'll have the real first hand experience of it. Then educational leadership policy. Um, so that's one thing that, that lots of MAs, funnily enough, that, that try and approach uh, leadership management and administration, they miss out on this altogether. Uh, policy is incredibly important if you're an educational leader because that's, that's your daily bread. Uh, that's what gets handed to you by those people up there. Um, it's, you know, if you're an international school, this would be the board of directors who, who mandate policy for you or the director. Uh, and if you're in the public sector, this would then, of course, come from government. In Britain, it would come from number 10 Downing Street. Um, if you're in a private school, in a national private school, this would again come from the board of governors, but it would be influenced by the government itself as well. So all of these things affect how you lead as a leader. It's, they tell you what you can do and what you can't do. And then there's again that interesting bit in between of how much do, act, do you actually do what you're told to do and how much lee room do you have as a leader in education to not do what you're being told to do. And that's where the interesting stuff really happens. Okay, those are the first two semesters of the year. So that's the first year, basically. Great, um, thanks, Alex. And Martin, I know I'm conscious of time. I know you're, you're kind of joined us in between teaching. So again, I really appreciate it. So just before I kind of let you go and, and you kind of go off and, and do, do what you do best, um, what have you kind of enjoyed so far in terms of from a unit perspective in your first year? And then kind of what are you looking forward to going into your, your final year? It's quite a big question, sorry. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm one of those really cheesy people and I am, I've am. i loved every moment of this course so far, I have to admit. Um, I really enjoyed the initial um, on-site meeting that we had where we all met one another and we got to meet the course tutors, etc. cetera. Um, but also even just from an internal perspective, I've been very motivated through all of these because this course really does allow you to put um, theory and relate it to your own personal practice and your, as Alex has said, your own personal leadership practice and no matter what capacity that is. Um, previous to this year, my leadership practice had been as head of department and following on from that, it was from taking leadership roles as a teacher. So, I mean, over the space of 10 years, I've been able to build up and build up my experience and it's culminated in where I am now. And it's allowing me to, to take the knowledge of all these different units and look at it from various different perspectives. I mean, yeah, each of the three units offers something very unique. The first unit, when we were talking about leading models of uh, educational leadership, really allowed you to sit back and think about what, and where and how uh, you have as you personally have associated with leadership models in your own practice and what you've seen others use. The second unit looked at research, and um, as Alex was saying, it was very research based, and that put their own personal interests uh, into their different scenarios. In my scenario, I looked at distributed leadership, one or an aspect of leadership, because it was relevant to my own person, personal context in my school. And I felt that that was something that I wanted to delve into deeper. And this course really allows you to look at your personal contexts and apply all of the knowledge and theories and generalizations and gives you the time to reflect on it as well. So yeah, like I'm really cheesy in the sense that 
<laughs> I loved every moment of it. And actually, I'm really looking forward to the rest of it because it's something that I'm very motivated about because I want to be the best leader that I can be. And I want to make sure that, yeah, I make a change in my school as I move forward as an, as an educational leader. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Martin. And if you do have to go, I know you're, you're, I think you're taking the kids swimming, I think, (laughs) if that's correct. Yeah. So (laughs) if you want to go and do that and be a good leader, then go for it. Thank you so much for your, for your time today, as always, Martin. Um, It's great to see you and I'll, um, I'll catch up with you soon. Excellent. Thanks very much. See you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, Alex. So I guess we can walk through year two. Okay, you're right. So let's go through year two. Um, right. So this unit here, educational leadership as a social practice, this is uh, a very, very important one in the, in the degree because this is essentially what a lot of our research at Manchester over the last decades and, and at other places too, um, all around the world, uh, is starting to show us. It's starting to show us that educational leadership is not like military leadership it's not like leadership in 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 hospitals or in corporations or in businesses it's it's a it's a different thing and the thing that makes it remarkable is that it's a social practice because it's about people it's about children it's about young adults it's about uh, grown-ups it's about all sorts of people getting together and uh, working out people's development and helping nurture people to to improve on themselves so if you if you boil it down to its core element that means it's it's emancipatory that's what it's about it's about helping people to become better and by doing that helping the world to become a better place and the way that we do that as human beings and the way we've done that you know over over hundreds of thousands of years is as a social practice and so that's very important uh, in understanding what educational leadership is that unit is led by uh, Dr. Stephen Rayner. Um, and then we have our sixth unit, which is an optional unit. So you can either choose to do this unit or if you so wish, and if you have uh, prior learning credits from a, from a master's degree somewhere else, you can apply to have that recognized and then you can have a break in this space here for about two months. Um, or you do one of our units here. Um, the one that I'd recommend that you do is the one which is my specialism, obviously, is international schools leadership. Um, it's the only one of its kind, as far as I know. Um, that also comes from the fact that my specialism is in international schools leadership. So that's uh, uh, a unique feature of this course that we offer that. Then there's the digital media and information literacy and leadership, which is run by uh, Dr. Drew Whitworth, and then leading learning is still in development. We're not offering that yet, um, but will be in the next year or two. So those are your options in the in the final unit of the third semester is that you either can take a break or you can do one of the optional units. Now that leads us into the final semester. So this is when you're uh, in the second half of your second year and often or normally in a master's degree, the typical setup is that you would do a dissertation. So this is a huge, big chunk of a piece of work. It takes up, uh, I mean, in our full-time course, uh, people start the process in December and they finish in September. So it takes nearly, I mean, up to nearly a year to do the dissertation. Um, And it's a big piece of work. So we know that our people uh, are busy professionals and we know that the work that they want to do needs to be related to their practice, which is why we have changed this format for this master's degree. So instead of doing that, we offer a 30 credit unit of research skills. So this is really important. And this often you don't get this in a, in a dissertation master's degree. Um, <clears throat> this is what you often get in a PhD. You get research skills taught to you in your first year of a PhD. Well, we've done like a mini version of that here. So you get research skills taught to you for one half of a semester. And this is a credit bearing uh, 30 unit part of the course where you learn about things like methodology, uh, about ethics, about uh, what it is to to research. Now, people often wonder why this is important as a a practitioner and as a leader. Well, 30, 40 years ago, maybe it wasn't very important, but now 
if you can do your own research and if you are research savvy, it just gives you the extra strategic edge that other people don't have. It makes you powerful because it means that you can uh, you can find data, you can interpret it, and that means that you can then influence your organization based upon data, not based upon opinion or based upon um, belief, but based upon data. And that's very, very powerful. And having those credentials to be able to do that is vital. So that's that half. And the other half <coughs> is a um, 6,000 word project. So just for orientation, a normal dissertation at master's is about 15,000 words, um, sometimes 20. At PhD, it would be about 80 to 100,000 words. So this is a 6,000 word project. So it's really, really not over overly academic. It's not overly uh, go away for, for six months and sit in a tower on the top of a mountain and write a dissertation. We know that that's not helpful for our practitioners. This is research-based and it is practitioner-based. So it's about your work, your practice. Um, and then that's assessed as are all of the units as you go through and that's the end of the degree. Okay, so the practical details of the course. Um, well, as you can see from that picture, that's what a, a typical room would look like at the University of Manchester. Um, that's also around about the regular co cohort size that we have. We have anything between about 15 and 25 people in a cohort. So these are very uh, small, intimate sized groups of people. Um, as Martin mentioned earlier, one of the great things is that you get to network with all these people all around the world. Um, and the great thing is they're like you, they're going places. So they are going up the ladder. And in 10 years time, that will be your network and the people that they know. Um, and it's just incredibly interesting to hear other people's perspectives from different countries and, and different, different levels as well. So principals talk to heads of departments, talk to um, teachers and everybody can exchange information. So that's a great bonus of it. So this happens in our face-to-face -face conferences that we do four times throughout the course and they're three days so that would mean we bring you to the to our uh, center and there you would be taught in in regular face-to-face -face teaching for three days you'd meet all of our lecturers you get to go out to dinner with us and we have a very nice time getting to know each other basically which is what's really important um, in in academia too is just nurturing those personal relations that we have with each other uh, yeah, it's uh, 20 credit modules, uh, one of which is optional, uh, and these are tailored to you, so you can work while you study. We would say it's about 15 hours of study per week. Now, most of this is going to be reading, and at the beginning, the tough thing is getting ahead back into the academic space and reading academic work again, so it might take a bit longer when you begin, but you'll find by the time you get to Martin's stage and you're half a year in, uh, you're flying again. It's this stuff is just like a muscle. It just needs training again. And once once you're doing it, um, it's fine. But 15 hours is about what you need. There aren't any exams. Uh, we have assessments at the end of every unit. And then the final project is assessed. And then it's a two year part time course. So it's flexible and it fits around you. So again, stressing the point, this is made for professionals. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, I just want to um, cover a question that I've had come through, um, which I think is quite relevant for the practical side of the course. Now, um, obviously, there's two units per semester. Um, so somebody's asked, how many assignments are we kind of looking at for, for each unit? Now, I think you've already covered that, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. So every unit that we do concludes with an assignment. The assignment is a 4,000 word written piece. Um, typically, that 4,000 word written piece is made up of two parts. One part is the assignment itself. Now, the assignments vary. It could be a critical literature review. It could be an essay. Um, it could be a discursive review. And then the second part, which is small in the waiting, is a professional uh, reflection upon your practice, relating it to the theory and relating it to your work. So that's your, assign your, it's your assessment at the end of every unit. So there are five slash six of them. And then you're assessed again at the end on the uh, final projects, which is that uh, bigger 6,000 word piece. 
Great, thanks, Alex. Um, so before I wrap up, I just want to um, let everybody on today's call and those watching it back about our next uh, scheduled webinar. So it's going to be at the end of this month on the 24th of November. So I'm going to be joined by Dr. Drew Whitworth. Um, so Drew, during this webinar, is going to be talking about how COVID-19 um, has kind of disrupted education in a way. So he's going to be talking about how this disruption has almost forced a remapping of our sense and ho of home and work and how technology comes into that and how it's maybe served or not served to bridge those two places together. So I think this will be a really nice session um, with me and Drew. So I'll send you how you can join that. Um, but it would be great if you, if you can, um, because I think it will be really insightful, especially during these times that we're currently in. Um, so my um, contact details are here on screen. Um, obviously, we are open for recruitment at the moment. Now, our next intake for this particular course is February 2021, and our second intake will be September next year. So for those of you who are considering applying, um, need a hand kind of with the application process, application form, or just want to have a kind of general chat with me about your background and whether you are eligible for the course, do get in touch with me. Um, at the end of this month, so end of November 2020, we are offering um, a 10% tuition fee reduction um, if you submit an application before the 30th of November. Now that's a little bit of an incentive to kind of hurry things along and um, Get in touch with me, speak to me so I can really help you and, and get that application over kind of the, the mark. Now, we have had a, a question around um, English speaking language requirements. Now, you do need to, to meet the requirements that we have set and you can find out about those entry requirements on our website. You will need to have a 6.5 in English language competency um, in the IELTS examination, particularly in writing. Um, now, if you would like to speak to me about your background and kind of your academic background and your professional background, do get in touch with me um, about that. I can really discuss that eligibility criteria in a little bit more detail. Um, and of course, I will absolutely send a schedule around of the course. So a bit of a breakdown of what we've discussed today. So you can see how those course units fit month by month. So you can have a look at kind of the course in a holistic way. Um, Alex, I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, as usual, it's been a great session. And for everyone who's listening via YouTube, um, either playing this back or live, um, I hope you found it insightful. And um, we really hope that you can join us in either February next year or September. Um, the course so far, I think, has been a massive success. We welcomed our second cohort in September, and they're already kind of getting getting to grips with it all and, and loving it. Oh, so two second cohorts. Two second course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Alex, thanks again for your time. Um, and Pleasure. we look forward to connecting with all of you, hopefully in the future. Yes, we'd love to see you. Thanks, Alex. Speak to you soon. Okay, bye-bye.